Hi everybody, so welcome to uh, the rise of fascism in Italy and Germany and the rise of Adolf Hitler. And uh, even though Italy is mentioned in the title, uh, my apologies to Italy, but there are going to be a, a small footnote here. Nearly this entire lecture is going to be on the rise of the Nazi party and particularly Adolf Hitler, what that means for Germany and the world. Um, but before we get into that lecture, you guys get comfortable. You guys know the drill, get something good to drink. I got my peach iced tea ready to go, although I'm down to my one cup full. That might not be enough for this whole lecture. <laughs> uh, but you guys get comfortable, and I uh, hope you guys are all doing well. I hope you guys are enjoying the readings. Oh, I had a brief interruption there, as you guys probably know. It's a blink there on the screen. Uh, I had to grab a couple books um, because they're going to reference them here in a minute. So before we get into Hitler and Germany's dark descent, I want to mention something that's important to you guys, and uh, I also want to encourage you guys. <clears throat> so getting into this very important topic is not a new topic. I think the, the Hitler era is justifiably, infamously, to some degree, in the culture, well known for being evil. Of course, the Holocaust and World War II and the responsibility for that, and the complete denial of humanity of many human beings, and the, the darkness, and I think... Uh, that's well known, and you guys know about that quite well too, at least in general terms. Uh, but it, it's important to study it and understand it on a deeper level, to see, see the nuance, the complexity, uh, to learn the, the troubling signs of it, uh, the raw humanity of it, and to take note of that and take warning. Um, so the, the more we understand, the better understand it, uh, the more we're armed with perspective and tools to see threats in our own era. Now, we have to be careful here. I want to mention this at the start. We should be careful. We don't want to, every time we see a politician we disagree with or some movement we think is not good or we think is negative, to immediately reach for an analogy and just like the Nazis. We, ne we never want to weaken or sanitize the Nazis by complaint, comparing them to some... Uh, much, much less or degraded form of concern. We have to be careful. I think oftentimes the, the term like the Nazis is a, a term too easily reached for in our society to try to eliminate a, a group or to go with the absolute hyperbole of the strongest analogy we can think of and label it as Nazi-like. So I, that's a danger. And as a historian, I want to be resistant to that. I want to be I want to be precise. I want to be careful in my use of language and my use of historical analogy. That being said, uh, it is important for us to recognize that things we see around us that may concern us about contemporary democracy, both the United States and around the world, um, they may have many very important differences than the rise of the Nazis to power. And we don't want to you know, recklessly reach for that analogy to say these are what the Nazis are doing. But on the, by the same token, it's important to, in the larger picture, see what totalitarian states do, what states do that are weak in democracies, and states that are moving away that are antithesis or the opposite of a liberal democracy. A liberal democracy, liberal, of course, means individual rights. Uh, maybe in a simpler way, what you guys are reading with Tom Rick's book, uh, what would Orwell think of what we're talking about? What would Churchill think about what we're talking about this? This assault upon the individual. And this can come from the left and right, and that's part of the lessons of why you guys are reading Tom Rick's uh, Church of the Orwell is because uh, although in our political climate we tend to see good and bad, left, right, Democrat versus Republican, and so forth, um, but it, it's deeper than that. And I think the lessons of the 20th century and of what you guys are seeing is uh, these threats to democracy, the individual rights and liberties uh, can come from the left or right. In Russia, they're coming from the left, right? They're coming from the communism, Bolshevism. Uh, in Germany, they're coming from the right, from fascism, and Italy, from fascism. So it's good to be for us to wake to that. And uh, um, and as Orwell would say, to see clearly the fault in our own side as well, too, which is much harder to do. It's easy to go on Fox News, MSNBC, and CNN and see the other party is the bad guys. Those are the people who are Nazi-like. My, my team's doing good, though. <laughs> but those other guys, they're, they're bastards. So you got to keep an eye on them. And by the way, some of that's maybe to, to, a, to a degree is useful because we do need to keep an eye on our, the other parties and have perspective. But uh, I think the far harder road to hoe, but equally important, is to see the air within our own side and the, the, the awareness and knowledge, again, using the 20th century 
at a school laboratory of human development that both extremes on the left and right have a desire to coerce of power, the power to dominate, the power to limit or eliminate uh, opposition and dissent. For there to be considered one correct mode of thinking about some topic and not to be tolerant of a plurality of opinions. And for us to be very sensitive and protective of the best of liberal democracy, the marketplace of ideas, and the best of a Orwellian thought or in Churchill's thought, and many others as well, too. So, we're getting to the lecture shortly, but with that in mind, I have some recommendations for you guys. I know you guys are quite busy. Some of these authors I've already mentioned to you guys, um, you might recognize them. But, uh, you know, you you guys out there are, uh, some of you guys are historians, some of you are not, but we are citizens in the United States, and we all, in our small ways, we can be humble with this, we have to be pretentious, but we are guardians of our liberal democracy. And we need to be aware of what that is and be able to see threats to it. Not to fall too easily into labeling on the side, but to be realistic what we see. And so I have some books to recommend for you guys. Uh, and that'd be Anne App Applebaum's Twilight Democracy. And you see her subtitle, I love her subtitle, it says, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. So she's saying, like, look, let's be honest. To have power and have your way is incredibly enticing, especially if you see what you consider bad things in society. If you could have all the power and you could dictate, wouldn't your country be wonderful if your party dominated and you had to have those, those knuckleheads, or far worse, on the other side, and you marginalize their voices, or maybe even better, stifle their voices, smother their voices, instead just the utopia of your side in power and its moral righteousness in power. And Anne F. Vaughn saying that's, that's, that's incredibly uh, seductive, especially when the country is facing legitimate problems. Authoritarianism, as you guys know, totalitarianism often says, we got the solution for all these problems. Don't worry about it. We have these utopian solutions for all these problems. And that having a natural allure that has not gone away. A couple more examples, books I recommend to you guys. You guys also know Timothy Snyder quite well. Um, I relied a great deal on, uh, as I mentioned, on the history of Ukraine. He's done a lot of work for Yale, lecturing on that. I watched all his lectures on the history of Ukraine. Um, and over the holidays, actually, that last, last fall, I bought his very short little book on tyranny, 20 Lessons of the 20th Century. I recommend that book to you guys, but it's a very short, quick read. I think on tyranny is maybe 30, 40 pages in its entirety, and even the pages have quite limited text on them. Now, the version I like, which I really like, is actually the one here, uh, which is on tyranny, and that is uh, the illustrated version by Nora Krug. And it's a graphic edition. I like art anyways. I like graphic stuff, but it's a fantastic way. So you still have all of Timothy Snyder's content, but now you have a lot of kind of brilliant art, a lot of it, not surprisingly, drawn from the 20th century, Germany, Russia, etc., um, to illustrate these points of how the average citizen that you and I can be uh, protective of the best of our liberal democracy, to protect it from challenges both left and right. And practically, what does that look like? Like, what, what do you notice in society that's a concern? And then what do you as individuals do? Because I like this because it's practical. It's not just theoretical, like, well, you know, worst comes to worst, the brown shirts march through my town, what would I do? You don't wait for the brown shirts to march through your town, first off. <laughs> you begin as a citizen way, way before that. So what does it look like to be an active, uh, participant in protecting our liberal democracy. It's a great read. Again, I recommend the graphic version here on the right. Uh, but that's up to you. Another couple things I recommend to you guys, How Democracies Die by Stephen Levinsky and Daniel Zoblat would be a good choice as well. And finally, uh, John Meacham, a big fan of his, his uh, John Meacham, Soul of America, talking about the battle for better angels. Now that's the context of the American story and also the book on Lincoln too. But certainly John Meacham is chewing on these larger issues. So he's not t talking particularly about, you know, authoritarianism in a sense. But he is talking about uh, America um, grappling with our darker angels and how, do, how did our better angels uh, prevail or sometimes fail, frankly, for a while. But looking at an, an, an internal context, that would be a really good choice to go after. And you probably noticed a book popped up right there because I added it right now. Uh, 
this book came out in the mid 30s by Upton Sinclair, the great American writer, called It Can't Happen Here. Uh, and that is, could America get her own dictator? It's a classic novel in which Sinclair Lewis is worried. Did I say Upton Sinclair? Sinclair Lewis. Sinclair Lewis is worried about um, the rise of fascism in Europe, which he was witnessing in the early 30s, and his worry that could a demagogue or a tyrant, a dictator emerge in America, what would that look like? Um, but I like to think, God, God forbid, that could never happen. Um, we don't need to be alarmist with that kind of stuff. Again, both left and right tend to be alarmist with this kind of thing and point to the other guy as the end of American democracy. You know, that happens every four years. You've got to be careful with that kind of thing. But on the flip side, to also be awake. And we see, when we see troubling things, to be awake what those are. So that might be a good read for you guys as well, too. When you get more time. <laughs> I know you guys are busy. So, all right. So let's get into uh, uh, Nazi Germany and Hitler. So I want to talk briefly about the, what fascism is. So fascism is born out of the chaos of World War I. Economic catastrophe of the Great Depression combined with national grievance. Desire to claim a greater place in the sun. I mean, context of Germany, but all fascist countries have that, frankly. Fascism gives voice to many who are looking for a radical alternative to liberal, democratic, or communist styles of government. So in the, in the case of Europe, that would be Italy, starting in the 20s, Germany in, in the early 30s, uh, Japan, which that will be in the context of our class, but Spain too, and we'll get to Spain in a later lecture. So pick up your pen and pencil. Here we go. So fascism is an anti-democratic authoritarian state, usually headed by one supreme leader. And you guys have already done some good reading in your, in your textbook, Sources of European History, on the position of the Fuhrer and what that's about. So let's just reinforce what you guys have already read. But the fascists believe that one divinely inspired leader would possess the vision and the will to lead the nation to a greater level of greatness in the rough dog-eat-dog -dog social drama struggle that was a national racial context of the world. So the fascist view is the world is a rough place, it's not a safe place, only the, the strongest dog survives in this, and so you better be the strongest dog. And in order to win this thing, you need to have like this one leader who really channels the national psyche, the national will. And again, almost like this mystical, divine inspired individual can then successfully lead the nation through all this, the chaos and conflict required for that nation to enter its next stage of civilization development and its greatness in this world of, of conflict. Since you have this one leader, you don't need a democracy because democracy means everybody voting, everybody doesn't know what they're doing. In fact, they often frequently are wrong, frankly. Instead, this one divinely led individual, only he, be he, but it's a fascism, see cle clearly perceives what is needed of the nation. He embodies within himself the national destiny. Obviously, the position of the Fuhrer in Germany or Mussolini in Italy. Less so Franco in Spain, although he claims some of that. Um, all right, fascist states tend to be very militaristic. Again, and, and they're not apologetic about this because, again, they see the world as a dog-eat-dog -dog place. Warfare is a part of the Darwinian struggle. It's a natural part, just like the weather. So, of course, you want to come out on top of that. So, naturally, you need to have a powerful, strong army. You don't need to apologize for that because that is the nature of things in the world. Um, they're fanatically nationalistic. They really don't care that much about other countries. Now, this is quite different than communism. Communism, at least in theory, because in theory, like Marxism projects this utopia of all the world's people holding hands with joint possession of property, complete equality, and so forth. That's not the fascist vision. The fascists, honestly, are not that interested in the larger world around them. Now, if they want to become fascist too, they can be allies. That's great. But the fascists are above all concerned with your country, your bloodline, your people. Don't really care that much about others, especially the more unlike you they are, the least less you care about them. So, of course, they tend to be expansionistic. They seek territory and domination because they perceive their country is the best the most important, mystically chosen by the gods and so forth, to dominate. So they tend to be expansionistic naturally and unapologetically expansionistic. Naturally, civil liberties and individual rights done away with the interest of the state. Now, this is similar to the leftist movements, communism, for example. And this is quite similar. Even though it's a, fascism is quite different in some ways, 
but it's crushing of the individual voice, individual will, individual thought. This is quite similar to the fascist, I mean, sorry, the communist movements on the far left, the Bolsheviks, for example. So freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of press, right to peace of symbol, fair and independent judiciary, all that stands in the way of the national destiny. You can't allow someone who's a, who's a, a liberal Jew or an anarchist or a liberal Democrat and so forth to continue to publish or write and speak and speak out against the national destiny, to criticize the great leader. You can't allow that because that, that, that distracts your nation or maybe even prevents your nation from assuming its, its divine destiny following this divinely inspired leader. And so those people have no right to do those things. So the court, independence of courts eliminated, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of press, all that is curtailed. Fascist states control all the media. Now that also would be like the totalitarian states uh, that are communist. That'd be like Russia. Uh, and a secret police that crushes all opposition. Yep, that sounds familiar. So that's why I mentioned at the start of this, totalitar totalitarianism covers the extremes of left and right. Now, fascism has its own category. For example, it's not trying to create a global utopia. They don't really care about that. It is trying to create a, create a German utopia or an Italian utopia or a Spanish utopia. Not so concerned with the larger world. Fascist states, particularly Jap Japan and Germany, built elaborate mythologies of racial and cultural superiority and viewed other peoples frequently through a prism of unabashed genocidal racism. Yeah. Now, again, we're not talking about Japan because that's not our focus this uh, in this class, although it would apply to Japan certainly as well, too. But in the case of Italy and even more so Germany, they have these elaborate, it'd almost be laughable if it wasn't the consequences weren't so bloody. But these elaborate mythologies of racial and cultural superiority that the German ones are just mystically, just mystically empowered. Um, when I was a kid watching Indiana Jones and seeing the Nazis after the Ark, the, the Ark of the Covenant, um, and the hunt for that is in the first Indiana Jones. Now, obviously, Indiana Jones is a fantasy, but there, there's a little bit of reality there, which is Himmler, head of the SS and, and the Nazi party, was interested in these kind of mystical power things. So in that fictional movie, Raiders Lost Ark, the fact that the Germans are trying to find the Ark of the Covenant, and eventually, toward the end of the movie, I don't want to ruin it for you guys, they briefly get it, and he opens it up, and it ends pretty badly for him. Gets a suntan you can't say no to. <laughs> uh, but that's not all wrong when he's talking about these elaborate mythological, racial, cultural superiority, this mystical, divine kind of destiny of your people. And that, that fictional portrayal is tapping into a, a reality. Okay. So I mentioned my apologies to Italy. Italy has many wonderful things. We could spend quite a while on Mussolini. Actually, Mussolini pays way before Nazi Germany does. Hitler, in fact, is going to borrow things from Mussolini when he's doing in Italy because Italy goes fascist first. But because Italy comparatively plays such a, a tremendously less significant role in the 20th century than Germany does, because Italy... I'd say it's not really a great power in in uh, in Europe. It is a it is a power, but not really a great power. Whereas Germany is, and so what happens in Germany um, is what we spend our time in. Even though, again, I I do feel bad about this because there's a lot of lessons and fascination what happened in Italy too with Mussolini. One more thing about Mussolini I'd say is. Although his fascist experiment gets started earlier than Hitler, and Hitler will borrow things from Italy, Italy is never able to achieve the fascist control that Hitler will, will employ in Germany itself. Italy is more fractious, although certainly Mussolini is dominant. The fact that the Allies invade southern Italy, that many Italians are quick to jump ship and join the Allies, shows you that Mussolini's control of Italy was never as the iron grip that Hitler would have over Germany and the, the terrible consequences of the iron grip. Italy, and Italy under Mussolini never had that level of, uh, of control, although he would have liked it, certainly. Okay, so instead, let's move on to uh, Germany and let's get to the context. And this is important, so let me highlight this for you guys. So briefly, the context of which the Nazi party is going to emerge. So some of this you guys know, so I won't spend long, but Germany, of course, after the World War I, has lost the war and humiliation. 
The Versailles Treaty, as you guys know, imposed a tremendous burden on them. Um, Germany did not want to even sign those documents. Initially, they even resisted signing the Versailles Treaty because it's so onerous, so painful, so one-sided in that all the responsibility for the war is placed upon Germany. It's just uh, exponentially expensive, not to mention psychologically, for the, the national spirit of Germany to deal with this. So Germany is humiliated. There's a sense of betrayal. Germany had is unfortunately was able to delude themselves at the end of World War One that they had not really lost the war. Um, it's important to note that the German armies were still in occupied Belgium and France when the war officially ended on November 19, I'm sorry, November 11, 1918. Why is that significant? Because the typical German living in, say, Berlin or Hamburg or Dresden and so forth, the resident living there does not see Allied armies marching in the city as a conquering force. They see German soldiers come back from the front, but, but the the national territory of Germany is not conquered in the way it would be in World War II, where the Red Army and the American, the British, and the Free French are crushing Nazi Germany. The fighting is in the German cities. There's no question Germany is defeated. In World War I, for those living in Germany, you can understand to a certain extent why they could live in denial that they had not really lost the war. Now, that's not true. The German generals and the German government realize the German front lines are breaking down. It's only a matter of days probably before the German armies come pouring back into the German proper, fall close on the heel by the victorious Americans, British, French, and so forth. And you would have had actual German allied occupation, German cities, and the German army would not have been able to stop it. But the fact that that did not happen allows the illusion that we didn't really lose the war instead. The, the conspiracy theory, because let's talk about what, what it really is, and that we don't really lose war, but we were betrayed by the Jews and the communists and the socialists and the liberal democrats, that they caved and we necessarily were humiliated into war we did not really lose, but we're paying the price for it. Victimization also is part of that, right? Economic crisis, you guys are familiar with this, the Great Depression, not to mention uh, the Versailles Treaty put tremendous economic pressure on Germany. Some Germans felt that these new thoughts, for example, socialism and Marxism, which we'll get to here in a minute, are, are, are an assault on traditional German culture, and they feel very vulnerable to that. There is a lot of political chaos in Germany, a whole series of coup attempts, which we'll get to here in a minute. Um, both on the left and right, you have coup attempts. The Weimar Republic, which is nominally in control of Germany this time period, is quite weak, and it does not have uh, broad base support from the German people. And finally, the last kind of context here is the Communist Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, as you guys know from the previous lecture, uh, in Russia uh, plays a major role in creating both excitement among some Germans who are leftists and also fear among a lot of Germans who are, who are in the middle of the road or right wing who greatly fear the Communist Revolution. That All that, that pool of discontent and fear and anger and rage and worry and stress is a context in which the Nazi party is going to be born. See the artwork that's yeah, a depiction of Lenin there, of course, on the left, and the, the Red Army behind him on the right, you have the Freikorps. The Freikorps, these are right wing, many of them ex German soldiers now, as the German government's quite weak. They take it upon themselves as a kind of private volunteer army to defend uh, traditional Germany or conservative Germany from. Uh, any kind of threat, especially threats from the, the radical left, uh, communist, uh, socialist, and so forth. And this is simply a longer version of what I just told you. <laughs> German left defeat and angry. They blame, as you guys know, the Jews, communist, socialist. Communist revolution in Russia and uprising in Eastern Europe, uh, again, inspires leftist Germans, a significant number, and great, bring great worry and, and terrifies conservatives. I should highlight all this because you want to know it. A content. Additionally, both parties of left and right are energized. Again, the Weimar Republic government is not popular with either left or right. And so there's room in this field for your organization, again, either excited or worried or both, for your party organization to exert itself in this chaotic environment, and they do. I mentioned there's a whole series of various coup attempts by the communists and socialists, and later on by uh, right-wing groups, including Hitler. Uh, but the whole series of these coup attempts further the sense of angst and worry of the German public that uh, 
our side better win this because the other side is willing to use mass violence to win and take power, and we can't afford that. Additionally, political violence on bigger and smaller scales becomes quite common, and it's not just one side. You know, I, I think our common perception is the Nazi party and the SA and the brown shirts are going around beating up people, and they were. Uh, but that is not unique to them. The Communist Party in Germany also had its street thugs who go out and fight with people and attack people. The socialist groups have that. Other conservative groups also have their various thugs and uh, bruisers who go out and fight with others. And so political violence, frankly, is quite common on both the left and the right. The Weimar Republic, I mentioned, is quite weak. It's opposed by both um, traditional authoritarian government I start traditional authority in Germany is not broadly committed to democracy. The Weimar Republic is essentially a democracy, but Germany does not have a history of being a democratic nation. So the ethos or the cult, deep cultural attachment, which hopefully we all Americans have to our liberal democracy, Germany does not have that. It does not mean some Germans didn't support the Weimar Republic. Of course, some did. But Germany did not have a history of this. Germany's history has been much more authoritarian. The Kaiser was no Democrat, that's for sure. Uh, going back in, into Prussian history, that is not a democratic nation state. It's a very top-down, Germanic, authoritarian state. And many Germans, again, when they, when they say authoritarian, we see that as negative, of course. But many Germans think that's, that's, that's the strength of Germany. That's what Germany naturally is ruled. That brings order and stability. They view that as a positive. What that means, of course, is the democracy has a much shallower root, to use analogy of a plant, a much shallower root in German. It does not go down very deep because the average German is not particularly attached to the Weimar Republic or the larger context of democracy itself and are quite comfortable reverting to a traditional view of German politics and power in some version of authoritarianism. And, of course, economic world hyperinflation. That photograph you guys see on the left is of someone taking notes on a million Reichsmarks banknote because they're worth nothing or almost nothing. So you might as well use them scrap paper. And you also see German army feeding the poor in Berlin 31. Here's some of the street battles taking place um, in Germany uh, in this time period. Oops, I think over there. Okay, well. Well, I worry about that. <laughs> okay, so I was tinkering with that. I'm going to tinker with it right now. You guys, guys so, all right. Now, that is the broader context that is going to be fertile and tragically seed ground for the Nazi Party to emerge. Let's get to a brief bio of Hitler and the Nazis. And again, it's quite brief. But uh, Hitler's born in 1889. He's born in Austria. He's not even a German, ironically, although he'd get German citizenship later. The young Hitler is deeply influenced by Vienna's mayor, Karl Luger. Karl Luger is a very aggressive anti-Semite. Uh, Anti-Semitism is quite common in Europe. That's not unique. But Karl Luger is beyond the level of most anti-Semitism. In fact, envisioning some way for the Jews to exit the picture. Not just that we're suspicious of the Jews or we don't want too much Jewish control or so forth. These kind of conspiracy theories that are quite common anti-Semitic. Uh, circles in Europe, uh, Karl Luger is going farther than that, calling for a potentially violent end for the Jewish community. Hitler absorbs this. Now, it's not the only thing he absorbed, but he certainly absorbs that. Uh, he's also deeply concerned about what he considered, that, again, the kind of conspiracy theories that the Jews control finance, that they're a cultural, moral threat. Um, he's also deeply worried about Marxism as well, too. So that pulls together with a general, we just call it racism, social Darwinism, which goes hand in hand with that. Superiority of the German race and oncoming racial conflict, again, which he, he does not pioneer any thoughts. He's simply tapping into what already exists. And you guys have read quite a bit of this uh, in your textbook, Source of European History. So, you know, Hitler is not like alone. He didn't, he didn't coin these thoughts or, or originate these thoughts, but they resonate with him and he's going to channel these thoughts. In World War I, 
well, I, I should back up. He, would, he wanted to go to art school, envision himself as an artist. Uh, he was rejected from art school, as you guys probably famously know. He couldn't paint people, in case you wondering what his problem was. You can go online and see some of his uh, architectural kind of paintings. They're not bad. Not bad. You know, I, but probably most of you in art class could get something kind of similar. But he couldn't draw people. <laughs> so uh, his attempt to enter into art school fails. Uh, he goes through very hard times in that time period, a certain level of humiliation. And then World War I comes along and in a sense kind of saves him, gives him a national purpose. And Germany gives up for the war. And he serves bravely in World War I. Wins the Iron Cross with a higher German medals for his service in World War I. Now, he only gets to become a corporal in, in World War I, so he's simply a foot soldier. But from all accounts, serves bravely there. Gets gassed late in the war. Tragically, does not die from that gassing. But we would all be better off. He's in a hospital, recovering from a gas attack, when he finds out that Germany has uh, surrendered. Devastated by this. Just devastated. Like many Germans feel is betrayed, that the German army, he didn't lose. His German other veterans, they didn't lose either. They've been betrayed. Of course, this just fuels what you already has uh, anti-Semitism inside of him already. That's not new. And so the Jews, and the communists, and the, the weak liberal Democrats and so forth, they have betrayed Germany. There's a picture of him with his Bavarian Reserve Infantry Unit. After the war, Hitler joins the German Workers' Party which aimed to bring back some kind of national socialism and abolish just as a capitalism and create some kind of people's community. And Hitler quite quickly goes from initially being a spy from the German intelligence services on these groups to liking the group, participating in the group, and rapidly moving up in leadership in this relatively small group. Now you guys notice it's actually kind of a socialist group to some extent. I call it kind of a conservative nationalist hybrid socialist movement. So it actually has some leftward leaning parts to it, but it's also very concerned, it has rightward parts too. So it's its own kind of hybrid organization in a sense. So by the early 20s, Hitler has emerged as the most important person in this growing now, what will be eventually emerge into what's gonna be the Nazi party. And feeling that the Weimar Republic is quite weak, which it was, uh, and feeling a fairly rapid progression to leadership within this uh, right wing, again, it's kind of mixed, it has some socialist stuff, right wing, left wing kind of national socialist organization, uh, and Hitler becoming a very effective magnetic speaker. And you guys read the demagogic orator as part of your reading here on how Hitler has, this is by Kurt Ludecky, uh, how Hitler has. Uh, I want to pause here for a second. Well, to be honest, Hitler was a, a magnetic public speaker. I'm not sure him in a private setting had the most charisma, but certainly in the context of these mass rallies, Hitler, through a lot of hard work, because it didn't come easy for him, but through a lot of hard work, practice, repetition, um, is able to come a, become a quite magnetic public speaker. And so by the early 20s, he's already... I wouldn't say master this, but become, become very effective in this. Um, and so carrying this head of steam that he has fairly quickly from 1918 to end the war, being a, a nobody, to like 1921, 22, to being the acknowledged head of this new growing movement, this Nazi movement that appears to be growing dramatically and, and feeding this natural call for Germany to deal with all the threats faced around it, the weak Weimar Republic and the humiliation, and the Versailles Treaty and reparations and humiliation at the hands of the British and French, the threat posed by communist uprisings, which happened in 1918 and in 1919. Uh, and now Hitler is leading a movement to deal with these threats to Germany. So Hitler getting ahead himself along with some of the right wing uh, military commanders decides to seize power in Germany. No, the beer hall pushed, which took place November 18, 1923. It was a pretty ill-conceived affair. It does not come off well, and it fails. So Hitler and the SA on the brown shirts launched this along with some other important uh, right-wing former generals and officers who joined this, hoping again to install some kind of right-wing, but also 
again, a little bit of socialism to government to take control of Germany. But the police defeat them. The coup is fairly easily defeated. Hitler is arrested shortly afterwards, and he's going to be in prison. And you should know that because, again, he, his first attempt at power was not through democratic means. It's through violence. Now, it fails. Hitler's put on trial. There he is with some of the other officers who are part of this coup attempt. Knows he's not wearing a uniform in this because, again, he probably wouldn't want to because those men around him are all officers. He was not an officer in World War I. So for him to put on his corporal's uniform, even though he did win a medal, but to put on his corporal uniform, yeah, that's not good. Standing next to all these generals not look good. So he dressed in a civilian dress. Makes more sense. He's a veteran, of course, but he was not an officer in the war. So why would you... Why would you down, degrade yourself or downgrade yourself by wearing your, that uniform? At his trial, he did something the other defendants did not do. Most of the defendants tried to plead not guilty. Hitler goes 180. And it was a stroke of, of I don't want to praise Hitler in any way, but I suppose it's quite effective what Hitler does. Not to get, you know, again, we don't want to, we don't want to, we want to be careful not to make Hitler into a non-human monster when he when he shows a skill set just like Stalin, right? We need to be honest with that. What was Hitler good at? Um, he was a human being. Now what he did was monstrous, as we all know. But you want to see him as a full specter as a human being, well always keep in mind what what he is becoming is monstrous for the world. But Hitler wisely Instead of pleading uh, not guilty, pleads guilty. No, I, I, I'm proud to say I attempted to uh, take over the German government. I'm not apologetic. The Weimar Republic is a joke. Germany is being crushed by the Allies. The Vice Side Treaty is incredibly unfair. The Communists, the Marxists, the Socialists are a threat to the very lifeblood of Germany or German culture. I'm not apologizing. I'm glad I did what I did. I'm trying to save Germany. Guilty as charged. People in the court were impressed. Judges impressed with Hitler. Now, he was sentenced to a five-year prison sentence. He served barely over a year in very cushy conditions. Hard to even call a prison. It's almost like being under house arrest. Technically, he was in a prison, but a very cushy and brief prison sentence, just barely over a year. You can see he was in prison from February, 20, February 24, December 24. I'm sorry, like 24. While in prison writes his book, Mein Kampf, for my struggle, where he lays out his view of the vision of Nazis. And you guys read a brief excerpt of Hitler's Mein Kampf, where he says, pretty frankly, what is his vision for the world? Although you guys, again, you guys read only a very brief part of this. <clears throat> call his, anti his anti-Semitism, his call for living space, for culture superior of Germany's, the need to an annex large territories in Eastern Europe, uh, his vision of leadership, etc. There's Hitler in prison. I don't know about you guys, but that does not look prison there to me. But he's there in prison there on the left, along with his secretary and people coming to visit him, bringing him food, this nice tablecloth with flowers on the table. You see pictures on the walls. I don't know about you guys, but that is not my idea of prison. And there's a dust jacket from Mein Kampf. Gets out of prison, the Nazi party had been banned. So, and by the way, why he's gone, not surprisingly, other ambitious Nazis or proto Nazis try to take over his party. But Hitler quickly is able to regain power in the Nazi party and reassert his control of the party. Again, there's more to that story. We don't have time to go into the deeper, but, the, but he's able to relatively quickly reassert his control of the party again. And Hitler decides we're not going to do the, the coup. The coup didn't work. Instead, we're going to use the electoral process. Now, it may not be a clean process, and he's certainly not above using violence to manipulate how that process works. But his next goal is to use uh, the electoral process. Hitler appeals to Germany at this call for a strong leader. I mentioned that already. I think all these things to protect Germany, regain Germany's rightful prominence. The reason why it's important is Hitler is very successful, and I'd say savvy, to tap into aspects of German society to appeal to uh, as a solution to their fears, their desire for greatness, their escape from the humiliation they feel, uh, their desire to be the best number one in Europe and really in the world, and that Germans are superior 
and Hitler taps on these already existing fears and hopes, aspirations that Germany has, and Hitler is very successful in tapping into those inbuilt, very strong human emotions, and he taps into those saying, if I was in power, if my party is in power, would meet all these things. By 1932, he gets enough votes in the Reichstag to become an important force in German politics and eventually has himself uh, chosen as chancellor in 1933. Again, there's a lot that happened in those years. We did not have really time to get into because of the sake of time. But um, there's one Nazi poster in 1932 calling for the vote. And that's the essay posted there on the right, too. And the essay, of course, are a big part of Hitler's rise to prominence. And speaking of the essay, let's pick up the essay. So the essay or the brown shirts, brown shirts is because the uniforms they wore. But the essay um, are, let me back up a little bit. The essay, many of them are former World War I veterans. Many of them joined the Fry Corps after the war, these paramilitary organizations to protect Germany from the left wing and so forth. And many of those eventually are going to be drawn into the SA. But the SA, its origin was not in the Nazi party, technically, in a sense. Its origin was already in this strong kind of blue-collar working atmosphere of protecting Germany from these far leftist threats. Now, by the way, that, that melds very well with the ideals of the emerging Nazi party. So pretty quickly they came together, and the SA grows dramatically in the years as it works with the Nazi party. But it's important to keep in mind that the SA, to some extent, extended existed prior to the Nazi party, they have some level of aspirations or hopes that in some ways align with the Nazi party, in other ways they, they don't align with the Nazi party, although that will only emerge later in an important context of what happens to the SA. But there's Hitler and a bunch of SA leadership. There are some examples of the SA. So the SA are essentially are the protection force and the violence pro projection of the Nazi party. So when, that, when Hitler is speaking at some beer hall and the local uh, communists find out, they might send some, th some communist thugs to come and assault Hitler or break up the meeting. So Hitler feels like we have to have security to prevent that. And that, of course, is going to be the SA. So the SA comes on board initially as protection bodyguards for Hitler, protection at his, these, these very raucous, rowdy meetings, um, and also then to be project Nazi uh, power typically through violence and intimidation. So it could be journalists who are printing bad things about the Nazis. It could be attacking communist gatherings, street fights, the communists and socialists and anarchists, uh, intimidate any kind of political opponent, politically or in the world of media and so forth. And this is the job of the brown shirts. Of course, the brown shirts are deeply anti-Semitic. They also mean assaults on Jews, murders and so forth that the essays are involved in the essays involved with. Once you guys know the head of the SA during these core years that it becomes aligned with the Nazi party, that's the Ernst Rom there on the left. Ernst Rom becomes a close personal, well, I don't close, but to some degree, a personal friend of Adolf Hitler. Uh, he's running the SA. Uh, he loves the SA. He's very visionary in his own mind what the SA is going to become. And uh, let's pick up here what I want you guys to write down. So, yeah, the SA are the brown shirts, was a paramilitary force in the Nazi party. And it was an important factor in its rise to power. Again, both its protection and also projection of violence and political power. Yeah, violence intimidation. Yep. So the FSA is often involved in fighting of various forms against any kind of opponent or critics of the Nazi party, fighting other paramilitaries, the communists would be one of the most common, um, but not just the communists, other groups too, Jews, England's critical political opponents, all those are fallen victims of SA violence. Now, SA is allied with the Nazi Party, but I mentioned it there, they, because they existed prior to the Nazi Party, so they have, to some degree of autonomy as a separate organization. And again, they're all allied with the Nazis, but they have their own officers, uh, and so uh, they have their own vision of what's going to happen for them. For example, the SA tended to have more working class origins than a typical Nazi Party member. Typical Nazi party member tends to be middle class, sometimes upper class. The SA tend to be from the lower class, the working classes. The SA 
under Wam, the desire was to actually completely replace the German military, the Reichswehr, uh, or the Wehrmacht, with the SA. So the SA's idea was we will become the German military. The German military, of course, was not interested in the German military, although it's quite small because of the Versailles Treaty. But the German military is still a staff with professional Wehrmacht or Reichswehr officers. Many of them come from the higher classes, uh, have a kind of Prussian class outlook, and they look down on the chaotic violence and, frankly, thuggery of the brown shirts. The brown shirts are quite well aware of this, that the German officer corps looks down on them. And uh, so their hope is that the SA will just become the German military. Of course, Rahm would be head of the new German military. That's part of their vision. The SA also, frankly, if you love Fight Club, that is the, that is the SA. That is the brown shirts. The SA love these street fights. It's kind of their idea of hyper-masculinity. It's what they like to do. And so, again, that is not always necessarily aligned with the Nazi party. The Nazi party comes to official power when Hitler becomes chancellor in 1932, Hitler wants to back off, at least for the time being, on some of the more chaotic street violence that is associated with the party, for good reason, and that the SA does. But the SA likes the street violence. That's who they are. That's what they do. And so when Hitler is trying to go mainstream, respectable politically, once he's formally now part of the government as a chancellor, he does not want to be tainted with this more chaotic penchant for violence that is the natural condition of the SA. And so the Nazi party grows frustrated, and Hitler grows frustrated with the SA because the SA continues to do what they naturally do. So eventually, for all these reasons, and also even personal jealousy, let me highlight this for you guys, uh, Himmler and others get Hitler's ear, Himmler and the SS, that they want to get rid of the SA leadership as a problem. For example, the German military despises the SA. The idea that the SA could become the ger new German military with the SA officer corps now, the head of the German Wehrmacht, Hitler's like, that's not going to work because I need the professional German soldiers and the, and the soldierly class, all these officers, and they are not going to go with being put under the street thugs, which is uh, the SA, the brown shirts. That's not going to fly. And I need the German army for obvious reasons, as you guys can imagine. Hitler's expansionistic. He has plans, and he wants the most professional military possible. He wants the professional German military class, not a bunch of three street thugs. Maybe have some war experience, World War I, but typically not as high-level officers. And so Hitler's like, no. Got to have the respected German military, not the SA. So, and again, there's more to this story. I won't get too deep into this, but Hitler is is convinced by Himmler and others that the SA is a mounting problem. They're not really a discipline, a part of the Nazi party, that they're too independent-minded, love violence too much. They have their own political aspirations, their own personal ambitions. This is a problem that has to be dealt with. And famously, what's called Night of the Long Knives, which I should highlight for you guys, or put there in bold, uh, with a sudden swoop of violence, Hitler and the SS swoops down on the SA leadership, arrests them, and shoots them over the course of a couple of days from June 30 to July 2nd, 1943. And they eliminated, within the next couple of days, the SA leadership. Now, the SA as an organization did not disappear, but they're told your leadership is gone because they're disloyal to the Nazi party. Now you're directly under the power of the Nazi party. And the SA is going to lose its importance. And people in the SA are going to actually join the SS or other German organizations. So the SA will no longer be a driving part of the Nazi Party moving forward following the Night of the Long Knives and the uh, murder or execution of the SA leadership, including, of course, Ernst Rahm. And that takes us to the successor organization because it's not that the Nazis have given up on violence. But they want to have a much more disciplined, controlled system of violence under their direct party control and absolute loyalty to Hitler's vision. And that'll be under Himmler. And so the SS is born, uh, similar in a way to what the, what the SA was doing originally as a bodyguard for Hitler himself. But ultimately, the SS will grow and grow and grow and become a private, disciplined army of the Nazi party. Whereas the German Wehrmacht, the larger German army, is a German army, the SS is directly a, a, 
a, a animal, a creature of the Nazi party explicitly. Like when I was a kid, I thought all oh, Germans are Nazis. No, the Nazis is a party. It's like in Russia, the Communist Party. Russians in Russia may not may or may not be part of the Communist Party. Same thing for German. German generals, German officers may or may not be part of the of the Nazi Party. But the SA is, are all Nazis. And they're very tightly controlled and utilized by the Nazi Party for their goals. Oftentimes it does, of course, mean violence. But it's a disciplined controlled party loyal to Hitler, a Nazi vision under Himmler. And there's Hitler and Himmler there. And let me go back for a second. This photograph is kind of chilling because that's Ernst Rom, head of the SA. Right behind him, wearing the death head logo of the SS, is Himmler. And Hitler standing right behind Rom is very symbolic because Hitler. Himmler and the SS is going to replace the SA as the violent wing apparatus of the Nazi party. So the SA has a whole variety of functions besides protecting Hitler as a bodyguard. They're also in charge of the Nazi secret police, famously the Gestapo, as you guys know. The SA, SS would also have actual combat units. Uh, they'd also be the security functions of one kind or another, and the SA are also going to be those most responsible for implementing the Holocaust. So the death camps are all run by the SS. Um, a lot of the killing units going in Eastern Europe oftentimes may include other units, but typically the SS is who is running the show, not the Wehrmacht. Sometimes the Wehrmacht gets kind of pulled into it, but typically it's the SS who are doing these things. So the Holocaust, elimination of political opponents, with the Gestapo, uh, protection of Hitler, all this is the private Nazi army protection force, projection of violence, which is the SS. There's Hitler and the SS members. Again, Hitler, and there's, there's Himmler, who is head of the SS. Um, that's Himmler right here, and right behind him is Reinhard Heydrich, who's number two in the SS, who had been running that, the Gestapo for a while. Uh, we'll talk about Reinhard Heydrich perhaps uh, in a later lecture. And there's Hitler talk at Dachau concentration camp in 1936. And Dachau in 1936 was not technically the extermination camp that Dachau would turn into. Now, it was a camp where death was frequent. It was an internment camp for political opponents of the Germans. So that would be communists, for example, leftists, journalists, anyone who's criticizing the Germans, and of course some of the Jewish leadership in, in the Jewish leadership end up there, and not surprisingly, many of them do die there. But it's not the outright intentional extermination camp that will emerge with during World War II itself as part of the Holocaust. Now, obviously, it's not a good place to be at, but some people in those early years actually were released from the concentration camp. No, quite a few died there, not surprisingly, from abuse, from violence, from ill treatment, and intentionally so. So, to say the least, that, that it's a Nazi SS controlled camp tells you much what you need to know about it. Um, for example, uh, the idea of due process, access to a lawyer, etc. No. Once you end up at Dachau, headed by the SS, the Nazi party has already made a decision about you. If you're really, really fortunate, perhaps, perhaps you may get out. Good chance, of course, you'll never see a light of day as a free person and you'll die there in that camp through abuse or violence. All right. Sources on the SS. If you need some grim reading, uh, that book uh, Heinrich Hitler by Peter Logrich might be a good choice. So the arm, uh, Army of Evil, and Masters of Death, or Hitler's Hangman, the Life of Heydrich. Uh, Heydrich, any of those might be a good choice if you're curious about li looking into the, this dark aspect of the Nazi party. Which, well, there's many dark aspects of the Nazi party, but the SS are certainly some of the darkest uh, spawns of the Nazi party. Speaking of, I think I'm about to wrap this lecture up and I'll do a follow-on lecture because we're not done with Hitler, but uh, I want to mention some sources on Hitler and the rise of the Nazi party. Uh, let me see here. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll stop the lecture right here. We'll get to sources on Hitler, some recommendations on you guys if you want to dig in deeper for greater reference, but I think we'll get a source of Hitler and the rise of the Nazi party with the second follow-on lecture, but that's enough for this one. So... I don't want to leave you guys look at that grim visage. Well, none of these are around the Nazi party. There's no easy place to leave off. That's just a reality. So we'll pick up this lecture and get into uh, Hitler coming into real power. So far, you've seen his rise to power. Now he's just getting into power. And we'll get into early days of his power 
and how he goes from a coalition government to absolute power and dictatorship fairly quickly in the events that made that possible. And that will be with our next lecture. For now, we'll stop right here. So we'll see you at the next one. So take care, everybody.